um, for the purposes of introducing our last um, keynote speaker for the day, um, which should hopefully enable us to conclude early. So, Sue. Thank you. I don't think I should have the honour of wolf whistles, for goodness sake, not at my age, but I shouldn't admit to that. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Carol Tenepa, and some of you will know her. She's been around in international circles and libraries for many years, and um, comes, has been writing in internationally, she's been presenting internationally. Carol is the Chancellor's Professor at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville and the Director of Research for the College of Communication and Information, and Director of the Centre for Communi Information Communication Studies. Her areas of teaching and research include information access and retrieval, electronic publishing, the information industry, online resources, and the impact of technology on reference librarians and scientists. And she's the author of at least five books. She's also published over 200 journal articles and is a frequent speaker at professional conferences such as this and since 1983 has written the online databases column for Library Journal. Carol tells me that she's just written the last of those. Um, she's been doing it for 28 years, and so she has just written the last, and I have not read that yet, so I'm sure everybody will be rushing out to go and read that now. Um, with, great, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Carol to come up and speak. Unfortunately, she has got a bit of an injury to her ankle, um, so she's creeping around at the moment. We'll see how she goes. Would you like to stand up for a minute? <laughs> Feel free. It's been a Stress stimulating, but a, but a little tiring. I, I am really glad to be here. In spite of my um, misstep at the Auckland airport yesterday, <laughs> so I'm sort of hobbling around. But uh, in spite of that, I really am. Uh, glad to be here. And I have really fond memories of my last trip to New Zealand, and in particular Dunedin. Uh, I was here when my son was with me, he was six years old, and my husband was with me. And um, I was speaking at a telecommunications and, and computing conference. And we had a family tradition then of reading a chapter of a book every, every night. And the book we brought with us and we're reading then was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, you may know where this is going. Um, the conference offered us a choice of activities. And one they offered was a tour of the Cadbury Chocolate uh, um, Factory. Uh, that was a no-brainer. <laughs> um, my son felt he'd won the golden ticket. And he saw Willy Wonka around every corner. And when I called him up um, uh, to tell him that I was going to come to New Zealand again, now, he's 25 now. Okay? And he said, chocolate factory. <laughs> it made a lasting impression. Um, and you know what I was thinking? When I was preparing for this talk, I was, it would, uh, th this talk has nothing to do with chocolate or literature, but it has to do with value and, and of academic libraries. But I happen to think, you know, what, what, a, what a good example of the value of, in this case, other kinds of libraries. But libraries help uh, connect us, connect children and adults with wonderful literature, and help spark the imagination. He, his imagination was you know, on overdrive <laughs> at that, but it was really through the power of literature and, and the written word and the spoken word, because we were reading this out loud, that really helped. So um, that's an exciting kind of value of library. I'm going to focus more on scholarly value in academic libraries um, for the rest of today and, and maybe get a little more serious than that. But uh, it certainly is, has brought back wonderful, wonderful memories. Oh, and by the way, for those of you from out of town, I do understand that the Chocolate Factory still gives tours, so you can check out a copy of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory from the local public library if you have a little bit of time and, and take that tour. So let, let me talk now seriously about, about academic libraries and value. Um, you know, the value of the, of the university library to faculty, students, administrators uh, has long been assumed, and all of us here 
deep down in, in our heart know the value of the library. We know the value of our print and electronic collections. We know the value of our teaching and research related services, our portals, our guides, our catalogs, and our physical spaces. And we know that they're essential to the academic enterprise and to the success of our students and teachers and, and researchers and, and other members of our academic community. However, in an era of um, not only decreasing resources, but also choices, um, choices brought by technology and other kinds of things that the academic library can do, academic librarians all over the world are faced with finding the best ways to measure the value and demonstrate the value of the library to all of our stakeholders and to gather evidence that helps us make the best choices when, when we can't do everything in terms of, of where we go for the future. So I'm going to talk about research methods today. 4.30 in the afternoon, I feel it's sort of a cruel thing to do, but uh, um, we're going to look at, at some methods and ways that value can be measured and, uh, and, and uh, can be demonstrated. So if, if you just group um, ways of, of measuring value into kind of some major, major categories. The first of those are implicit. I've got to be careful not to walk. I'm, I'm a pacer, and I've, I've got only one foot. So if I have to walk, I'm going to have to hop. So I'm going to try to stay here. OK. Um, hold on. Um, the, val the first category of, of value is what I would call implicit value. These are things such as gate counts, usage, downloads. People use our materials, use our facilities. Therefore, we assume they are valuable to them. They use them more, the value has increased. And these kinds of implicit measures are things that, that, that libraries are very good at and have been doing, for, of course, for many, many years. Um, explicit value can be done with interviews or focus groups or, or, um, or surveys. The idea of asking people about what is the value of the, of the use or the value of a particular service. And the difference, of course, between implicit and explicit value is many differences, but one, one, one main difference is that implicit value does not get to purpose or outcomes of use. It gets to the idea that using, therefore, there is value. But to get beyond that into purpose and value, you really need to dig a little bit deeper uh, and look at some explicit values. There are also um, many methods of derived values. For example, contingent valuation, return on investment. Um, so there's, these are methods that include collecting lots of different kinds of data and then monetizing or looking at um, exactly what, what is the, um, converting that into dollar, what is the value in terms of, of a dollar value, or explaining it in monetary terms. So there's three, really kind of three, three main categories of value. Um, if we look at those implied values at use, if you looked at your download figures or your circulation figures, you might, over the last 30 years, you might see something like this, um, certainly download of electronic materials. This happens to come from the um, surveys I've been doing for, for 30 years. Um, been doing surveys for 30 years, been writing the library journal column for 28 years. Once I get on to something, I hate to give it up. But um, we are collecting more data. Um, more data now um, uh, in 2010, 2011 to bring this up to date. But the last time we, we brought it up to date, we could see a, a, a clear trend um, in terms of amount of reading. This is the average number of article readings per, this is university science faculty member in affi affiliated universities, that is universities that have um, electronic journals uh, collections. And, and many of my, much of my research is really looking at reading and, and journal use. So a lot of my examples will be from that. But the methods uh, can be used in other kinds of things too. But the idea is that reading, the average amount of reading has gone up. Therefore, um, you know, the increased use uh, has an implied kind of value that we, we, we're not exactly sure of, but we can, we can uh, look at these kind of uh, figures and think about. By the way, the single most um, source of those additional readings is from the e-journal collections in libraries. So we ask lots of other questions about where the readings are coming from, and the library has contributed the most. 
Um, something I don't have here but that I often talk about is the other trend, the parallel trend to this. Um, reading's gone up by 80-something percent. The amount of average amount of time spent per article has decreased by about 35 percent. There are still only 24 hours in a day. You can only read so much. So amount of reading gone up, time spent per reading gone down. That's one measure of success. People can find things beca uh, largely beca because of libraries' collections quicker, um, can have access to more things. It's also sort of a non-sustainable trend <laughs> that we have to think about. And, and somebody uh, earlier mentioned this idea of, of reading faster and faster and spending less time per article reading. And we certainly see that, that people want to be able to understand things quite quickly. So that's a, that's a kind of an implied value. And there's lots more we can say about that. But because most of you do that, you, you measure your gate counts, you measure your downloads, I'm not going to talk about that so much today. What I want to talk about is going beyond the kind of implied value and look at value, explicit values and derived values, to look at what is the purpose of use. And in the case, in my examples of reading articles, what are the outcomes? How does that give value back to the stakeholders and to the university? And how do we demonstrate that? And then also um, look briefly at return on investment. So as we know, there's lots of different methods. And I'm not going to go over all of these. I'm going to focus on critical incident and return on investment uh, today. And critical incident as one method of looking at um, explicit, explicit value. So, Here's the things that I'm going to be talking about, just kind of use as my uh, acknowledgement slide, and then we'll go on and give you some examples. Again, the um, surveys that we've been doing for, for 30 years, and what we use is critical incident. That is, to get beyond amount of reading, we want to focus in on purpose of a particular reading, and then look at all of the purposes and look at the, the values of reading. Um, and then um, a series of studies on return on investment that is an international collaboration of librarians, researchers, and publishers, and looking at, in academic libraries, how can we measure return on investment. It's been done a lot in public libraries and corporate uh, company kinds of libraries, done very little in academic libraries, and I'll talk about those. And then, um, then tell you a little bit about a um, study I'm working on right now, funded by the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services that's looking at multiple methods of, of value. Okay, so crit critical incident. The reason I like to use critical incident for explicit values is if you look at critical incident, you can focus in on a particular instance and you can look at per how does the purpose and the, how does, and the value go together. So what we do is we have a sample of users or a sample of faculty members in, or, and students, in this case, I'm going to mostly give you examples from faculty. Um, and then we ask them about the last article they read. You could ask them about the last book or book chapter they read. You could ask them about the last time they used a library instruction class. So the method could be used on anything. But the idea of a critical incident or a last instance is you can get beyond that implied value. What you do then is have a second stage sample. So if, if I've surveyed all of you, you guys are the first stage sample, and then I asked for, tell me about the last thing you read. Then that group of readings, all of the readings represented in this group is the second stage. So that's the second stage sample. So I can talk about readings, and I can say things like um, re where readings were found, and where does the library fit into that, and how valuable they were, and what was the outcome of that. So we could say, you know, that 10% of the readings wasted people's time, or 60% of the readings helped people do their jobs better, et cetera. So that's what the second, second stage is. And again, the example I'm using is what we've done uh, consistently is looking at scholarly articles, but it could be on, on anything. The, um, it's really important to define things, and you know, it's amazing how difficult it is to define an article now. <laughs> used to be real easy, you know, containers were kind of easy. Um, so we just keep 
you know, sort of expanding that, but some, some people keep saying, ah, these containers are not going to be relevant much longer. Perhaps that's true. Uh, maybe then I can retire. But, uh, but for now, uh, the, the containers, people do still think of containers. Now, we have um, recently started doing surveys that look at other things, uh, specifically um, uh, e-books and, and non-article um, non kinds of, of websites and blogs and things. But here we're looking at scholarly literature. The other thing we have to define is reading. Because we're saying if you go beyond table of contents, if, it's, if there's a table of contents, or beyond the title and abstract into the body, we count that as a reading. Now, using critical incident, we can ask, how much time did you spend on the reading? With what care did you do the reading? I just scanned it. I really paid attention. All of those kinds of things to look at how, um, um, how that reading really is embodied. Some folks say if they don't spend, a, you know, if they're only scanning, it's not a reading. We say that is a reading. So when we look at that increase in reading, um, it has always included, um, it has always included scanning it. Um, but people are spending, doing more scanning, spending less time per article. So looking at that critical incident, then we can look at purposes of reading. So the first kind of step in this value, demonstrating the value where the library fits into the value of scholarly reading, in, in our case, we find that of all the readings that uh, faculty members uh, did in Australia and US at uh, uh, selected universities, that about half of those readings were for the purpose of research. But the other half were for teaching, current awareness, writing proposals, and a whole lot of other things. Um, personal interest, whatever. But a half, about half were for research. Um, again, this is faculty members. We have the data for students, but I don't have it for 30 years. There is a relationship between purpose of reading and where they found the reading. So the readings for research, about half, again, of those are provided by the library. For current awareness, it's a whole lot less. More current awareness readings are found from personal subscriptions. For teaching, there's kind of all over. The library contributes to teaching as do others. So the blue section in all of this is the library contributed reading. Another reason for going beyond downloads or library use is we want to compare where the library fits in with the rest of the world. How much, the library is not a monopoly in finding information, and of course in the journal area, less and less so. So we want to know how does the library provided collections compare to things that people get from personal subscriptions, from the open web, from colleagues, et cetera. So we have all this, this the last thing you read, where did it come from? Um, and again, the readings for research are more likely to be, to be from the library. We asked then to, for people to look at the essential. How important was it? Um, absolutely essential, somewhat important, et cetera. And I've just here pulled the absolutely essential um, ratings. And we find that readings for research, more likely to come from the library, if we could have followed my logic here, are, are um, rated, uh, over 40% of them are rated as absolutely essential and, and almost uh, uh, t uh, double that if you included um, important. Um, what's interesting here is the readings for writing proposals. Now remember the readings for writing proposal was a small percent of the total number of readings. But they are rated, more likely to be rated as absolutely essential and also more likely to come from the library. There is not necessarily a relationship between amount of use and value of use. And that is really important to remember when you talk about things like measuring value of special collections, for example. Sheer amounts of use doesn't give you the whole picture of value. That one reading or that one use, even though it may be a, a, a minority of the, of the instances, may have been absolutely essential to the purpose and contributed to, to that person's scholarship, to, what, to their outcome and what they were doing. So it's important not to only, only give measures of amount of use, especially in a non-monopoly situation where people can be getting things from other sources. Um, readings that contain um, information, again, when we asked about the information contained in the reading, how important was it to your purpose of reading? And those that come from the library are more likely to be rated as um, absolutely essential to the principal purpose. 
So readings may come from all over, but the readings that came from the library collection were more likely to be, to be rated as absolutely essential. By the way, coming up are readings from others, particularly the open web. Now part of this has to do with open access scholarly journals. And so libraries have to be careful, of course, not to build the whole value proposition on collections. You know, therein lies, uh, lies problems in the future. So don't, don't build the whole thing. But, so that's, that's coming up in terms of, of, of uh, success. But helping people find the best is, is absolutely a, a part of the library. Um, this is an aside. Um, this is a studies that were done in U.S. and Australia, and, and again, these are these are several years old, and we're we're bringing things up to date um, in the U.S. Um, there was a, there is a difference based on age. Um, again, we're controlling for role. These are all academic staff. Um, th this does not include students. By controlling for role, there are some differences based on age. Uh, for one thing, is that uh, younger scholars or even then more likely to read more from electronic journals than print probably not surprising but also are less likely to print out that is more likely to read on the screen a majority of, of all ages by the way still were printing out but but the younger there was a significant difference in terms of reading on the screen based on age and also have fewer personal subscriptions so this means rely more on the library and other sources because uh, fewer, fewer personal subscriptions. Uh, when I talk to uh, professional societies or to publishers, that's something that, of course, it is a matter of concern uh, for those communities in terms of um, subscription uh, rates and age. So if we follow these threads now, are you with me? Okay, so readings for research or writing proposals are more likely to be rated as absolutely essential than readings for other purposes, or more likely to be found by searching. I didn't mention that, but if I use critical incident, I can ask, how did you find it? Um, and, and we, of course, we define searching and we define browsing, but did you find browsing, searching, someone, uh, a friend told me about it, um, all of these other, uh, other things for students. It was assigned in a class, those kinds of things. So readings for research or writing, searching, um, absolutely essential, more likely to be, come from uh, electronic sources than, than print sources. Of course, print resources in the, in the um, journal field are a minority of readings, but there's still a fair su substantial number, um, particularly from, from personal subscriptions or in humanities, and more likely to be from the library. So again, we kind of follow all of this uh, trait down to demonstrate that some of the unique uh, value proposition that the library provides. When somebody says, ah, but we can get things other places. Uh, true, um, but this is the kind of the, the um, story uh, of, of the library's contribution. The other kind of explicit sort of, of value is to look at outcomes. And um, we always ask about what was, what was the outcome of the reading? What, what did it help you or not help you do? What, what, did, what did difference did it make? And so lots of, we let people choose more than uh, one answer. We give them uh, space to add other answers. But the top two, I think, are particularly important when you think about um, scholarship and, and the academic library and kind of the future of where things are going. The top two um, answers are it helped, it inspired new thinking. It expanded my, my thinking. It made me think beyond just the reading, which of course um, is something that uh, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory sort of did to my son as well. So reading, reading uh, does this uh, whether you're six years old or, or 60 years old. Uh, the second is it improved the results of what I was doing. So if my purpose was writing a proposal, it helped me write a better proposal. If my purpose was doing research, it helped improve the way I designed and did my research. So those are the top two, um, but lots of other, other things. The, the, negative, um, the only negative choice that, that has shown up on these was the, the last one, and it was a very small percent of readings. Now, of course, not all measures of value should be quantitative. Um, we do a lot of quantitative, but we also um, collect qualitative kinds of stories about, uh, about 
reading um, about uh, value of um, access to information. And qualitative methods help enrich that story, I think. Um, we did a study in 2008 and 2009 um, in eight universities of our faculties in universities in North America, Asia, Africa, and Western Europe. And we have um, tens of thousands of, um, of comments that were contributed by the, by the academic staff about how access to e-journals has helped uh, improve the efficiency of their work, the quality of work, or what they do. And these are just, just uh, some examples. Um, essential for scientific writing, um, couldn't do the kind of work I do without um, access to these resources, has, um, has made me more efficient, facilitated interdisciplinary research, et cetera. Um, we also had quite a few that said it saves me a certain number of 10 hours a week, um, somebody said, they estimated. So we've got lots of, lots of these kinds of, of um, comments. And those kinds of comments really put a personal face, if you will, on, qualitative, uh, on quantitative kinds of, of numbers. They, um, they enrich the quantitative results. They um, provide additional evidence of the value that uh, access to e-collections brings. The, um, it's, it's all the rage now um, to build personas that's been used in marketing for many, many years and advertising, but a lot of people in information sciences now are doing that. That is, taking the statistics behind the quantitative studies to find certain clusters or group of people, giving them a personal kind of, of, of persona, and then looking at the quotes that are, are contributed by people who fit that profile. Persona building in, it has not been done a lot in libraries, although it has been done in, in, in some, um, British Library has done it to, over time and other, other public libraries and, and state libraries have done it. But it does give a personal kind of face. It's not an individual, it is based on the quantitative statistics, but it really gives you an idea and helps convey the message of these kinds of people use these kinds of resources and have these kinds of, of um, of um, attributes and comments. And it's really important so I could take that group that was doing research, found sources from the library, um, had a positive outcome, and then could look at um, that sort of persona. Another kind of persona that's really interesting is the successful faculty members, the award winners. And we always ask questions about publication amounts and have you writ, uh, won awards in the, in the past, those kinds of things. You can build a persona, you can build a picture of a successful faculty member. Um, those of you who need, are in academic libraries and have to contribute to um, any kind of government exercise where you're looking at what's the contribution of the library, but also there's this idea of what's a successful faculty member and how, how are they, how are they, um, their, um, how does their reading and how does the library contribute to what they do. Now I say this because our studies have shown that people who read more, um, People who, who win more, publish more and win more awards also read more. There is a, a, a correlation um, between those two kinds of activities. Again, it's a picture. I don't know about cause and effect, although I probably believe there is, but it is certainly a, a picture of a successful faculty member. Okay, let me, let me move on to some derived measures. Um, derived measures are a little more controversial. Um, again, if you feel, you know, the university library has inherent value that really ought not to be put into dollar terms, there has been, there is a fair amount of, of resistance or, or folks, you know, it, it, as I say, it's controversial, don't want to do it. But, but it can be used in proper context um, and, and multiple methods, and that's why I want to talk about this. As I mentioned, an international team of researchers, librarians, publishers are working on looking at uh, or demonstrating that for every dollar uh, spent in the library, the university receives income back. How does the library contribute to, to the income, not just the outgo? This became really brought home to me, really important to me, when a um, chancellor at our university, who, who thankfully is not there anymore, um, said publicly, the library is a black hole. I throw money in and nothing ever comes out. And the more money I throw in, I don't get, you know, I still don't get anything out. So if that kind of thinking is, uh, 
is rife in, in your university or, or spoke, this is a kind of method that you can begin to look at, okay, money goes in, but also the library contributes to the, to the money coming out or the success of the university. The, um, the studies I want to talk uh, or introduce you to um, really are, are three phases. Phase one, um, the, uh, you may have seen the white paper. It was a, a limited case study. It was funded uh, by Elsevier at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And it looked at one aspect of return on investment. It looked at what is the library's um, e uh, journal collection, how does that contribute to the grants process? So there is a clear money coming in uh, effort going out there because there's grants money coming in. And how could you assign a value to the grants? What portion of that could be contributed by the library having access to, to resources? And so that's what the phase one. Um, narrow in since it's just one university case study and really the focus uh, was, was limited just on grants. Phase two, um, which was um, also partially funded by Elsevier, uh, and w this is the one that I participated more in. We expanded it to eight universities in eight countries. Does this method work? I mean, University of Illinois is a huge research-oriented university that brings in many, many millions of research dollars. So could this same method and this same narrow focus, could it work internationally and at others? So that, that one, both of those have been finished and the white papers are, are available for those studies. Um, what I'm calling phase three, but it's really kind of goes beyond that, is we've expanded the focus in, in the Lib Value project um, that I mentioned was funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services in the U.S. And in that we're looking at multiple, uh, multiple kinds of services and products in the academic library and looking at multiple methods and how can those be used to, um, to, uh, to measure value, not just return on investment, but a variety of other methods. Uh, th those are, um, th that's uh, University of Illinois is involved in that, Syracuse University, uh, University of Tennessee, Association of Research Libraries, and, and some others involved in that. Um, that one is, is only includes uh, U.S. universities. So the first two phases of those return on investment studies. Um, we know from prior research that libraries help in conducting research, help in the, the authorship. Um, a lot, there's been a lot of citation analysis studies, for example, that look at, at the library's role and what's being cited, and, and then the writing process. But what we, want, or what we wanted to do in those two um, phases of return on investment is to put in that other arrow. What's the library's role in obtaining the grants? Once people have done the proposal, have written, is what, how can you assign a dollar value to the, uh, to the obtaining grant process and how you fill in that missing spot. Um, at the phase one University of Illinois, and, and um, again, the white papers are available um, so you can see the full calculation. And if anybody wants to talk to me about these uh, calculations, I'd be glad to do that. I suspect that not everybody wants to hear all the details right this afternoon, but it is, it is fully available. You can see, and you can tinker with it, you can change it, uh, you can use it just as, as is if you'd like. But what they did by looking at, um, they used multiple methods, a survey of faculty to find out how important are citations in your proposals and what percent of your readings come from the library and then um, looked at the dollars coming in from, from uh, grants. Um, uh, the research offices provided that information. Then looked at the library budget. And it was found that, uh, in that study, found a little over a four to one uh, kind of return on investment. Um, for every dollar invested in the library, the total library budget, the library helped contribute um, over four dollars in terms of the grant income. That is, the, the importance of the citations that came from the library were a part of um, claiming a part of that grant income. Phase two, as I mentioned, we expanded um, to eight uh, institutions in eight different uh, countries to try to look at um, does, this, does this method scale and does it translate is, is really the, the point of that. Now, I'm going to give you some numbers. Here's one of the limitations of ROI. Once you publish a number, 
<laughs> Once you give an ROI number to your administration, guess what? That, that number will never go out of their head. So you've got to be a little careful with return on investment numbers because, um, because again, they tend to stick. But let me, let me just tell you what we found here. We found three bands of return on investment, again, for grants only. We found the real high band. That is research institutions with heavy, heavy STM, science, technology, medicine. The return on investment in grants and the library collection was huge. Their grant numbers are huge, but the library was heavily involved in helping building collections that would help with grants. So those are the top. They're not just North American. Um, Though, in fact, they neither are, there's two in here, and neither, neither were North American. They are those that really focus on STM and grants. So that's the one band, really high return on investment in grants. The middle band, which is where most people fit and where, where University of Illinois uh, fits, are those that have both a research and teaching mission, but heavy, um, heavy emphasis on externally funded grants and on research, but also a, a big teaching mission. They have science, technology, medicine, but they also have humanities and social sciences. And so this is where most of them, most of them fit. It's the one to, to four kind of uh, um, range in terms of the relationship. And then the last ones, um, those that were under, not, not many of these, but those that are under one, are, in, in other words, the return on every dollar invested in the library, the, the return in grants was under a dollar. Those um, were very much focused on research and teaching, but really heavily on teaching, and very much focused, um, uh, one of them was very much a humanities-based um, uh, institution, so, so not a lot of grant money, and then, in, and then the other one was in a country where there was no big focus, there wasn't a lot of external uh, funds available. So there, there's uh, all, three, all three bands. Um, so a message here, <laughs> of course, is that yes, a method can be used, but you've got to be really careful to look at the mission of your particular institution. This is the kind of, of study that I think is, uh, is important and you may be asked to do and I think uh, has value, but it really, if you're going to measure return on investment, make sure you measure something that, where, that is really valued by that institution and it, it makes sense for those for sure. Um, the other thing that we did in, in those first two phases is we looked at, we interviewed upper level administration, that is um, chancellors and, and provosts and things, to find out what were their uh, values and what did they think the library could help with. And one of the things, or, well, or the first two were, were revolved around faculty members. How can we help attract outstanding faculty and how can we retain those faculty members when they're here? And there's kinds of evidence that you can build around those kinds of values. So again, it's just like um, using return on investment carefully so that match it matches the mission. Here is frame the message of value, um, the value and contribution of the library in the terms that the upper level administration in your organization or the funding agencies or the government agencies in the, in the mission and roles that they feel are important. Um, some of the evidence that can be used for these, um, I mentioned that we have, in our studies, we've looked at success, what makes a successful faculty member in terms of publishing and awards, and there is definitely a relationship between success and reading. So providing at good access to collections makes a difference. Um, and also the evidence that, um, that the library is the single most um, greatest source of readings. There's lots of others, but for, especially for research, the, the library is the main source of readings. The next two um, measures of value is how can the library help foster innovative research and help build the research reputation of the institution. And again, in each of these, I've given some qualitative kinds of comments um, uh, that you can see, but I want to focus on the quantitative a bit more. One of the things we ask in, in surveys is for every article you, you um, cite, how many more do you read? What does it take 
to get to citing an article. And we found, again, internationally that it's um, on average about 27 to 40 articles read for everyone cited. Therefore, if you're just doing citation analysis, you've got to remember that's a gross underestimate of the value because they're reading widely before they decide to cite something. So this idea of wide reading helps and, this, and, and helps get the thinking going, if you will, and helps make the research better. Um, we did find in that study of eight universities, we found that in two, we looked at 10 years um, of data, and we did find a correlation between increase in library budget and an increase in grant funding. Now, for the other eight, there wasn't a negative correlation, <laughs> you'll be glad to know, okay, but there just was not a statistically significant correlation. I'm, I'm a little, people always want to say that they want to be able to show that if the library budget gets cut, then there'll be dire consequences, and I don't feel quite, you know, I, um, I don't have the evidence that actually shows that, but in two, we do, we do have this correlation. Um, the other is there have been other studies um, by others um, that show that faculty with more publications and citations attain more grants. So it's this kind of building this evidence of success, what makes a successful person, a successful faculty member or student, and, and what is the library's contribution to that success, direct contribution to the success. And then finally, something that every kind of library has been working on for the, at least the last two decades, this idea of seamless integration into, into workflow. But how can we make sure that the institutional research activities, that the library is embedded um, and, and recognized in, in the workflow and in the research ac activities? Um, the um, Research Information Network in the UK did a study um, last year that looked at the relationship between downloads at universities across the entire UK and research productivity and looked at that over time to see, see what the relationship is. And they did find there was a, um, a correlation between um, article increase in article downloads and an increase in productivity. So it kind of, get, again, it brings this, this, um, this idea of making reading, making collections a part of the, um, of the normal kind of, of work that's done. Um, let me end by telling you just briefly about the study that we're involved in right now, which is the, the LibValue study. And again, the idea um, of the library is the heart of the university, but it is not just research. It's teaching and learning. It's social professional, socialization of students, as well as, as the, the research by faculty members. So we want to make sure that we look at the values of all of those. It's not just return on investment, although that's important. It's also looking at outcomes and, and um, how can we uh, tie the library to the success of all of the stakeholders in the library. So what we're doing in this project, uh, kind of biting off a lot, but I have a really good team across the country, is we're looking at the value of all services. Now, we have teams right now that are looking at values of e-collections, but also special collections. Remember, I mentioned that with special collections, you don't want to look just at amount of use, which, you know, again, traditionally has been done. So we have a study now that is using several methods, like pop-up um, uh, surveys as well as in-depth interviews to look at a particular instance of use and how that how that has helped, uh, what's the outcome and how that's uh, helped change the, the purpose or helped made an impact. Um, we also are looking at facilities, um, looking at uh, commons, and um, as well as other kinds of services. Now, what's particularly important in all of this is to look at the role of the library on what's important in a particular university. And what's really tough are those downstream measures. The further away from the use, the harder it is to measure. You can do an instruction class and then ask people, you know, did it help you, was it interesting, or at the end of the semester, you can measure grades of group when we've got an experiment going and others have done it where we look at uh, student outcomes based on exposure to the library. Those are a little easier, but as you go further, it's really difficult. So we're working with the student outcomes, um, learning outcomes center on campus to look at can we measure the role of physical space, information commons, and student retention. One of the things that our students between their first and second year have said is that one of the reasons they leave a big university like the University of Tennessee is they feel lost. 
They don't feel a part of it. They don't think there's a place to go. So the library's physical space, hanging out in the coffee shop or the commons or whatever, does that have a relationship? That's kind of a downstream, but we're looking at it at several points. The students who um, are retained and the students um, who, who leave, choose to leave. Um, other th kinds of things, special collections, what effect does that have on donors and donations in the future? So making that uh, relationship with the library, again, sometimes it calls for um, gathering multiple methods of evidence gathering to be able to make that, make that connection. And anticipating change. It isn't, uh, measuring value isn't just justifying that what I, I do good stuff. What I do is good and valuable and therefore don't touch my budget. You know, it's the idea of how do we change? How do we remain relevant? How do we choose from among alternatives? So we are looking at um, scholarly endeavors that, that, that cut across the traditional roles of teaching, learning, research, and, and social prof professional. The roles of librarians in e-science. I must admit that in the previous talk, the talk of, of a library or staffless library causes me to have a bit of a, a lump, you know, right here because it's the value of the librarian that's really important in a lot of these. The embedded librarian, the librarian involved in e-science, not necessarily the library. So I know it wasn't staffless 24 hours of the day, but, uh, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing I don't want to send the message that, that that will work. So, and what's the role of the librarian and collaborative scholarship and, um, and publishing institutional repositories and commons and those kinds of things? So, what we can show so far, um, we know that, um, that there are multiple ways to measure um, value and, um, and we can, we've shown so far that academic library e-collections help faculty uh, be successful. Um, help generate, at least in the grants uh, income, um, help generate some portion of that income. And, and certainly e-collections are valued by, by faculty. Um, I wonder, I, I tell you, I must admit, I spent this morning trying to find an appropriate uh, quote by uh, Dahl. I didn't think of it until, until I was here and, and reviewing my notes. I thought there must, certainly there must be. Um, and, and of course, he doesn't write anything about anything to do with scholarly <laughs> activities. He's talking about reading books. But um, somebody else quoted from Matilda, but here, here is a, a quote from Dahl that he talked about. Learning to be a reader gives a terrific advantage. And we know that for kids, that learning to, to be a reader, not to, to, uh, to, you know, to incorporate everything in that helps kids succeed, but also we've shown that it helps, it helps faculty members succeed too. This idea that um, um, getting involved in scholarly literature and, and, uh, and understanding that helps, helps in the uh, measures that we have the success of faculty. Um, the other, the other um, cautionary note is return on investment. Um, it, it will vary by mission and location of institutions, so be sure to match that. To, um, to the particular um, uh, institutional um, objectives at your, your institution. So some final thoughts on measuring value. Um, again, return on investment is, is one method. Um, there's many other methods and quantitative methods um, tell, tell a, a good story and they can show trends and they can show things like return on investment uh, and qualitative stories can, can, qualitative data can tell the story or can put a face on those quantitative results. No one method stands alone. Um, academic libraries um, are adding positions um, of um, assessment librarian, for example, or adding that kind of function because it's an important sort of function if you haven't done it uh, traditionally. We need to measure outcomes, not inputs. Um, and, and not usage, um, but, but looking at what is the outcome and the result of what the university um, library and librarian contributes to the, to the scholarly endeavors and um, need to be measuring ways of and value of all services. The um, this study I mentioned, um, the Lib Value study, the website is up, and I do have to say that we can't possibly do every method and every service in every case. So one of the first things we did was work on a, an interactive bibliography of other uh, literature 
that, uh, that shows it. So if you want to find it, it's searchable. So if you go to the website and you want to find out who's done studies on contingent valuation, for example, you can find those there and, and it will be directed to, to, to there. One of our team members, uh, Megan Oakleaf at Syracuse University, uh, just con uh, finished for the Association of Research Libraries and uh, Association of College and Research Libraries uh, an analysis of, the, of this literature as well, and that's available on the ACR website. But you can, so you can see what others have done because it's important to look beyond just the things we're doing. The, um, and, and so in conclusion, techniques to assess and measure value um, can help uh, show the value of the library's services, but also can help uh, decision makers select the products and services that provide the highest return on investment to the library community or the university community or the highest uh, value to the university community. Uh, it's important to measure and convey the value of the academic library, probably more now than it ever has been before because we are faced with lots of choices. Um, it's also possible to increase the value, and I go back to the, the title of my uh, talk, to sharpen the value edge of the library for the university by carefully focusing and refocusing the academic library's products and services. And the studies we've been doing and are continuing to do is one part of that. So thank you very much.